Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Susan Rice, President Biden's domestic policy advisor. And I want to thank Vice President Harris and Secretary Fudge for their leadership, as well as the Austin, Johnson, and Priestley families who will share their stories with us today. We focus on equity a lot in this administration. Usually, we're referring to making the system fairer for people who've been left behind, which was the president's vision in his day one executive order on advancing equity and racial justice. But of course, equity has another meaning. It can refer to financial equity, to home equity. So today, we're here to increase equity in all senses of the word. President Biden announced this task force in Tulsa, Oklahoma last June, when he marked the centennial of the Tulsa race massacre. Secretary Fudge and I joined him on that trip. We met with survivors of the massacre and saw up close how inequitable housing practices have for generations kept black families from building wealth. It was an emotional visit. Of course, these troubling inequities are not just relics of the past. More than 50 years after the Fair Housing Act, the gap between black and white home ownership rates is wider than ever. As we'll be reminded today, those disparities can be compounded by something as mundane yet insidious as the value an appraiser assigns to a home. The reverse is true as well. Studies show that eliminating the disparities in wealth generated by home ownership could significantly shrink the racial wealth gap. It was against this backdrop that President Biden in Tulsa called for, quote, an aggressive effort to combat racial discrimination in housing. The Property Assessment and Valuation Equity Action Plan we're announcing today is the product of that aggressive effort. For six months, 13 federal agencies and White House offices, co-convened by Secretary Fudge and me, have engaged in an all-out sprint. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Federal Reserve, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, many others. Together, we've developed a robust set of concrete actions and commitments to transform the home appraisal process so that no homeowner should have to swap out family photos or artwork just to receive a fair value on her home. I'm deeply grateful to the leaders and staff of the PAVE Task Force and to the staff of the Domestic Policy Council for their commitment, their creativity, and their extraordinary effort. This is a plan to be proud of. But our work is not over, and I know we can and will deliver greater equity to our housing market and to our nation. Thank you very much. Please welcome Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. Good morning. Thank you, Ambassador Rice, for that introduction. Madam Vice President, it is good to be with you today. And thank you for taking the time to highlight this important topic. And thanks to those who are here with us to share experiences that no one should have to experience. Today is a reminder that housing discrimination is not a thing of the past. Issues such as redlining and discrimination in home buying and refinancing are still persistent in our society today. When President Biden announced the formation of a task force to look at decades-long discrimination in home appraisals, he did so not because it was a news story, not just because people were sharing their experiences online. The president created this task force because he knew that if we were ever going to ensure equity in housing, we must take a closer look at issues no one has examined before. It's long past time to break down the unjust barriers which still limit the futures of far too many of our citizens, especially people of color. 
The homeownership gap between black and white families is wider today than it was in 1968, when it was still legal to deny someone a home based solely on the color of their skin. The Biden-Harris administration understands home ownership provides people of color a pathway to build a source of wealth they can pass down to their children and grandchildren. That is why we are working with intentionality to break down the barriers that have prevented generations of people of color from buying or refinancing their home. Over the past year, HUD has taken a number of steps to address ways in which we can close the racial equity gap in housing and enforce the Fair Housing Act. Throughout the pandemic, we took important steps to ensure that homeowners had a safety net that would prevent foreclosure. Through the American Rescue Plan, we continue to make resources available to those who need help. For too long, student loan debt has burdened too many potential homeowners, especially those of color. That is why we have made it easier for those with student debt to get a loan through the Federal Housing Administration. We also took the historic step alongside federal partners to make clear that special purpose credit programs, a tool that allows banks to reach historically disadvantaged groups is lawful under the Fair Housing Act. We have worked to reinstate the disparate impact rule and implement our affirmatively furthering fair housing requirement. Recently, alongside FHFA Acting Director Sandra Thompson, we signed a first of its kind agreement that enables collaboration on oversight of fair lending practices within the housing finance system, an issue still making headlines today. I want to thank Melody Taylor and the PAVE Task Force, including all of our partners, for their tireless work. This report is not the end of their work, but the beginning. Today, we are joined by those who have been personally impacted, and unfortunately, I know from a very personal place the impact of this issue. I live in an all-Black community. I live two doors from an all-white community. My house is bigger than the house two doors from me. My lot is bigger than the house two doors from me. And in my biased opinion, my house is nicer than the house two doors from me. But my house is valued at $25,000 less than the house two doors from me. So I'm losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity in my home because of the bias and appraisal. While much has been done, there is still so much to do. I will now turn it over to Tanisha Austin to share the impact that this has had on her family. And I thank you. Please welcome Tanisha Austin. Good morning. My name is Tanisha Tate Austin, and I live in Marin City, located in Marin County, California, with my husband, Paul Austin, and our two beautiful children, Kyron and Samil. Two years ago, right before the pandemic, we decided to refinance our home to take advantage of the low interest rates and to finish a remodel. We needed to have an appraisal of our home to, re to refinance. And we were shocked at the price of the appraisal when, when we received it. We then requested a second appraisal and asked a friend who was white if she would stand in to meet the appraiser. Our friend Jan, she brought over a family photo and we took down our family photos and replaced our artwork so there was no trace that the home belonged to us. A, a term often referred to as whitewashing. This time, the, the appraisal we received came in 50% higher than the initial appraisal, almost $500,000 difference. The impact of devaluing a home in this country is powerful. It can set back a whole community. The difference that we experienced in our two appraisals is also significant. It's the ability to pay for college. It's financial freedom. It's the foundation for generational wealth. This year, I'm starting a business, Critical Friends, to help principals and other business leaders improve their equity practices. Our family's ability to refinance and to build our own wealth has direct implications on my ability, my ability to also launch a business. I'm telling my family's story because I know appraisal bias is holding African-Americans back from growing and supporting their families in the way that we want to and deserve to. I'm grateful 
to Vice President Harris for standing with me and with other victims of appraisal bias and committing to taking on this issue. As Californians, we remember how she took on the big banks as Attorney General and fought to protect homeowners like us from unfair and often discriminatory housing practices. I am happy that she is able to continue this fight from the White House. I am so honored to be able to welcome her to the podium today, our Vice President, Kamala Harris. Good morning. Please have a seat. Please have a seat. Uh, Tanisha, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, she and her family, her husband, have been so courageous in telling their story and, and really speaking up and speaking out um, to help fix a, a terribly broken system. Tanisha, I'm talking about you. Um, but really, because your story is the story of so many families, and individuals, and the more that we are able to, to really highlight this issue, to educate the public in general about what is happening, um, the more we will be able to be successful in fixing the problem. So thank you for that introduction. Thank you. So today, we are joined by the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, the great Marsha Fudge. I, I'm going to go off script and say, that this, this is a, a real national leader. In her years in the United States Congress, she was always fighting for families, for working families, and for homeowners. As the Secretary of HUD, she has been, this has been personal to her to push through the bureaucracy to make this a priority, and it will benefit so many people who deserve to be seen. So thank you, Secretary Fudge, for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. We are also joined by the director of our Domestic Policy Council, Ambassador Susan Rice. Thank you for your leadership. And a group of homeowners who have been leaders in speaking against the injustice of appraisal bias. So thank you all for being here. So imagine a young couple that saves enough money to put a down payment on a home. The day they pick up the keys is a day of excitement and pride. That day, they own a piece of America. That home, they know, will be the foundation on which that family builds their future. As that home increases in value, that couple can count on that equity to help put a child through college or afford retirement or pass along assets to the next generation, and usually all of those things. Historically, Many communities of color, however, have been prevented from taking full advantage of the wealth-building power of home ownership. For example, and, and the Californians here and most of us remember, in California in 1913, California passed the Alien Land Law, which targeted Asian Americans from owning land. Similar laws were on the books in states around the country until the 1950s. In the early 20th century, millions of Latino Americans were removed from our country, their property confiscated in an illegal act inaccurately known as repatriation. And segregation, restrictive covenants, and redlining long, long denied black homeowners a share in the American dream. That inequity continues today in the home appraisal system. Appraisals are meant to be fair and objective estimates of the market value of a property. There's a lot that rides on that estimate. But far too often, for far too many people, they are not fair and objective. Research has repeatedly shown that black homeowners are more likely to have their homes undervalued than other homeowners and homes in majority black and majority Latino neighborhoods are almost twice as likely to be undervalued than homes in other neighborhoods. Because their homes are undervalued, because their homes are undervalued, because understand there's a real consequence, black and Latino people often have to pay more for their mortgage, receive less when they sell the home, 
and are less able to access home equity lines of credit. Systemic bias in home valuations widens the racial gap, widens the racial wealth gap, and deepens the longstanding financial inequities that divide our communities. And we've heard the stories, stories of people who have tried everything to avoid an unfair appraisal. Stories like that of Tanisha and her family. And these stories are shocking. And they are evidence that systemic change is urgently needed. Throughout my career, I have fought to defend homeowners from abuse and injustice. As Tanisha shared, when I was the Attorney General of California, we secured $20 billion for homeowners harmed by the big banks during the foreclosure crisis. And part of that was about predatory lending practices, targeting just the same communities that we are talking about today. So then I drafted and helped pass the Homeowner Bill of Rights to help protect consumers from unfair mortgages and predatory foreclosure practices. It was one of the first bills of its kind in our country. And our administration is continuing that work by fighting on behalf of all homeowners. Last summer, our president, Joe Biden, created the Property Appraisal and Valuation Equity Task Force, also known as PAVE. This task force will identify and root out systemic home appraisal bias. Today, after months of deliberation and collaboration with homeowners and home buyers, representatives of the mortgage and appraisal industry, and community leaders, our administration is releasing the PAVE Action Plan. This plan outlines a comprehensive set of actions that our administration will take to advance equity in the appraisal process. The home appraisal workforce is one of the least diverse in our nation. Less than 5% of home appraisers in America are people of color. This lack of diversity can introduce both conscious and unconscious biases that make home appraisals less accurate and less fair. Our administration will now require those who conduct appraisals for federal programs must take part in anti-bias, fair housing, and fair lending training. <laughs> there are solutions. There are solutions. And we will work with the industry to require all appraisers to receive this training. We will also help expand the training pipeline for new appraisers. In many states, in addition to classroom learning, appraisers have to complete thousands of hours of apprenticeship-like training before they become fully certified. So these apprenticeships, well, they're often unpaid. And apprentices often are required to find an appraiser themselves who is willing to take them on as a trainee. So if they don't have those relationships, if those relationships don't exist in their community, then it is much more difficult for them to satisfy the requirements to become an appraiser. So we have to take that into account also. And the solution, part of the solution, is to provide funding and technical assistance to states to make pathways into the profession more accessible for underrepresented groups. <laughs> Another issue is home appraisal algorithms. So algorithms, it's a fancy word for basically a, a, a system that will make decisions, right, based on the input it has that will arrive at conclusions that can have a real impact on the subjects of those decisions. So these algorithms, the home appraisal algorithms, have the potential, when used properly, to reduce bias in the home appraisal process. But if these algorithms are based on biased data, well, then there's a real risk they could produce biased valuations. So to address this, we are proud to announce that new rules are being developed to eliminate bias in appraisal algorithms. 
rules that if, and I'm going to say when, approved, will apply to all lenders using these technologies. So today we are releasing a resource guide for homeowners and home buyers who suspect that they have received a biased appraisal. And this guide will explain to folks who are concerned that this might have happened their rights. It'll explain their rights as consumers to challenge and correct a biased appraisal. And it is available on the website um, at HUD and will be available to all those who, who would like to have that information. Today, we are also launching a public awareness campaign to ensure consumers that they know their rights before they seek a home appraisal. <laughs> and our action plan serves as an important step toward a more just and equitable home valuation system. Our administration will continue to fight to ensure that all homeowners and home buyers in our nation are treated fairly. For so many people in our country, a home is more than just a roof over your head and a place to live. Those are essential needs. But a home represents, in addition to that, so much that is about financial security, that is about the potential to build intergenerational wealth. Owning a home, well, it means a shot at a better future. Owning a home is also a symbol of the benefit of hard work, the benefit of having ambition and aspiration for oneself and their family. And so we don't want to have a system that denies people an ability to have that goal simply because there is bias in a system. We can correct that. And our administration is fighting to make sure every person no matter where they live or who they are, has an opportunity to not only succeed, but to thrive. Thank you all and take care. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, I'm Susan Rice, President Biden's domestic policy advisor. And I'm honored to be here with all of you and with Secretary Fudge, my partner in crime, uh, because today we're very proud uh, to be announcing a set of transformative actions to address racial and ethnic bias in home appraisals. Our PAVE uh, Action uh, Task Force Plan uh, is really uh, something we're quite excited to roll out today. And we're really excited to have you all here with us to share your stories and your experiences so the American people know how real this problem is and how it affects uh, individual families and entire communities, as well as the wider nation. So thank you again for being here. Secretary Fudge. Thank you all so much, and let's just get started. And thank you to, as she says, my partner in crime. Uh, we couldn't have done this at, without both of our staffs and our teams working together. Thank you so much, Ambassador. So what we'd like to do is, is hear from each of you uh, as you share your stories as to how this challenges affected you personally. So Tanisha uh, and Paul, we heard a bit earlier, but not everybody who heard the original uh, presentation will be listening in today. So if you would start and, and share with us your experience, please. No problem. Do you want to start? Sure. <clears throat> so um, in uh, around two years ago, right before the pandemic, we uh, decided to refinance our home to take advantage of lower interest rates and to also finish a remodel. Um, and so we needed an appraisal in order to be able to, to, to do the refinance. So um, we got an appraisal and it came back uh, woefully low and we were very disappointed because we needed a certain amount in order to be able to do what we needed to do um, with the refinance. Yeah. Um, and so um, we were upset and um, I called our broker and told um, him that I was uncomfortable with the language that was used in the appraisal. Um, the, the appraiser said some, um, some terms in the appraisal that was uh, um, disheartening and frankly, yeah, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Um, and um, so we requested a second appraisal and you don't have to get approved for that, um, but we, fortunately we were approved for a second appraisal. 
And then at that point, I asked um, a friend to stand in yeah. and be me. Yeah, and so we asked our, our, our friend. Our friend, she's white, her name is Jan. Um, and she did, she came and stand in as if she was Tanisha, but within that time period, what we wanted to do, because we knew that white people get better loans, um, we just whitewashed our home. Mm -hmm. So we took down all our pictures, all the artwork, went through our kids' rooms. Um, and so that process, not only was it hurtful, um, you know, it was degrading. You know, we worked really hard to, to, to produce something, to have you know, we want to create generational wealth. And for our home to get devalued at that rate, um, it, was just, it was just hurtful, right? And so we just went through the whole situation and was hopeful that the next appraiser that came in um, that met with Jan would give us, um, you know, our fair appraisal. And, it, and she did. And it came in what? It was, uh, the original appraisal was for 995000 These are California numbers. And then, <laughs> in Marin County, County, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Let's just be clear about that. And, and um, the original appraisal came in at 995000 That's when Paul was there to meet the appraiser. Yes. Um, and then the second one came in when my, our friend Jan was there at $1.482,500. So $1,482,500. So that's a difference of almost $500,000, 50% 50 difference 50%. in a matter of three weeks because we changed our artwork in the, in the homeowner. Incredible. And how did it make you feel? I mean, once we you know, received the, the good appraisal, I guess you would say, it was almost a sense of, sense of relief. Um, but at the same time, it was, I mean, it still is hurtful, right? Like we still constantly um, is replaying our story, right? It went viral or whatnot. And it's just a reminder of the tax of being black in America. Um. I also would say that um, it's hurtful because you have to explain it to your kids. Um, you know, our, our kids are at an age now where they can ask questions. Um, and, you know, my son is interested in uh, how much the house appraises for because he knows that that means something. Um, additionally, like anytime we need to. Um, you know, if we want to refinance again, we have to get another appraisal. And you're always worried, like, do I have to whitewash my house again? Like, what, you know, what do I have to do in order to make sure I get my fair share? Yeah. And you shouldn't have to feel that way. You should know that your house is going to be valued based on the value of the home. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your story. No problem. Thank you. Thanks. Listen, let me just say this, though. So, if you have to go through it again, you won't be by yourself. Exactly. That's why we're here today to make sure that you don't have to live through that alone. Uh, because we are making it clear and shining a bright light on what is happening. And we are taking action to be sure that this doesn't happen to another family. I can't promise you it won't happen, but I can promise you we can do something about it if it does. Um, let me just see if I can frame for you just, just very quickly why this is so important. We know that today in this nation, the greatest nation in the world, that the average white family has about $8 uh, in assets to every $1 held by people that look like us. We tell people, even as a kid, one of the things uh, my parents would tell me is, make sure you can buy a house. It's the way most people of color, most people, period, start to build wealth for themselves and the generations that follow. So. And both of you can answer if you like, or all of you can answer if you like. If you had not been able to get a proper appraisal, what would it have meant for your wealth or lack thereof for your family? Madam Secretary, why don't we start with Michael Johnson, and, okay. and he can tell us his story in answering that right. question. Um, well, first off, thank you for having us here. Um, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that I'll be able to tell my kids about forever. Um, and our story is very similar to Paul and Tanisha's. Um, we were actually talking before the broadcast started, and it's very eerily similar. Um, essentially, the same time around uh, the pandemic really kicking off, uh, my wife and I, uh, we have three kids, so we were thinking we needed to expand our space or move. Um, we've lived in our house for over five years, so we figured instead of uprooting the kids, we would uh, just add on to our house. The bank that we were with at the time when we started, um, they didn't even 
offer an appraisal to come out. We met them at the bank. They told us what they could do, um, and it wasn't really lining up with what we were you know, seeing our future as. Uh, we went to a local credit union. Uh, I'm from Upper Arlington, Ohio, which is a little suburb right of, outside of Columbus. Uh, we went to a credit union. Um, the credit union um, went a little bit further, but still lowballed us um, with the appraisal. Instead of coming to actually meet us, they just did a drive-by of our house. Um, I'm part of an interracial uh, married couple, so um, I had three beautiful kids, and we were outside playing one day. I got a call from the bank. They gave me the numbers, and I said, but no one's come by to appraise. And they said, oh, we just drove by and gave a, a quick appraisal off of uh, what we saw. What they saw was a young African-American male with his kids outside playing uh, with a Black Lives Matter sign in the front yard. Um, we have an LGBTQ uh, flag painted on our front porch. Um, just, you know, an all-inclusive family. Um, they came back with a not only embarrassing offer, it was kind of disrespectful. Um, it was only really $75,000 more than what our, our home value was at that point in time. Um, there was no way that we would have been able to finance that project. So, you know, last thing, um, wife and I had a, a talk one night, and um, as we were sitting there talking, I pull up an article of a young Michigan couple who was going through the same things that we are. I uh, read the article, and they essentially did what Paul and Tanisha did, and they whitewashed their home. They took down all their pictures um, of their family. They took down all their artwork. They hired someone um, who was white to come stand in, and they got almost $150,000 more in their appraisal just by doing that. So my wife and I got the idea um, to do a similar situation. Um, so obviously my kids are um, the best parts of me and her, so I took the kids for the day. I removed myself from the property. We took down all of our signs. Uh, my wife did the walkthrough. We only left up pictures of her family, which obviously um, they're all white. Um, we took down anything of mine that left any type of resemblance that I live there. Um, that, was, that was probably the hardest thing, one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with, especially because my oldest son is 14. Um, so he knows, like he knows, he goes to school, he has friends who are mixed race, so he knows exactly what that meant without me even having to tell him. Um, and he was devastated and I never wanted to see him look at me that way again. Um, and so we, we, we staged the house um, and with staging the house, the bank came back with an offer of close to $225,000 more than what the initial offer was, and um, that that really hurt. Um, you know, we we do everything by the book. We're good parents. We take care of our kids, um, and so to potentially be told that, you know, we don't qualify based off of the way our family looks was was disheartening. You know, silver lining to it, um, we got the loan. We got the house finished. We just finished in December. The house looks great. Um, <laughs> our, <laughs> Um, our kids love it. They, they have the best time there. Uh, my oldest son has his own room now that he doesn't have to share with his younger brother, which really makes a difference for him. Uh, the bank sent the same appraiser back out after the work was done um, so that he could just check off his list and make sure that everything that we said was going to be done was done. And I put back up all our pictures, every single last picture. Um, I put back up all of, all of my personal effects. I actually had my wife leave the house this time, and I did the walkthrough. Um, you know, this was probably the most dehumanizing experience that I've ever been a part of. Um, the silver lining is that I get to sit here today with all these wonderful people trying to make change, but you know, it, it was rough. It, it definitely was rough, um, and it took me a while to get over that uh, that that hurdle of you know just being disrespected, thank you. Um, but yeah, that's our story, um, you know. I, I felt kind of like we were being like pushed out of our neighborhood by the appraisal we were getting, so that made me want to stay even more, just to prove them wrong. Um, and we're still there, and this will be the only house that I have for the rest of my life. Um, 
like Secretary Fudge said, you know, growing up in a black family, like one of the main things that we always did was go to my grandma's house. And she always had dinner for us, and we always just had a safe place to be. That's what I want to provide for my family going forward, and uh, hopefully with everyone here, we can look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I hope that appraiser got the message when you greeted him. And <laughs> he was very short with me when he came back. Um, I asked him questions. He was very one word, two word answers. He knew what was going on. I mean, he knew what the process was. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud that, you know, I've come from where I've come from and have a, a good spouse at home who, who backs me up no matter what. And you know, it wasn't fair, but, you know, here we are now. Thank you. Welcome. I'd like to also ask uh, the Priestley family, Jacqueline and Cassius, to share your story in, from nearby Prince George's County. Thank you for having us, and thank you for the great work of this administration to shed light and to address the appraisal bias issues that have you know, long, long stifled our ability as, as people of color to, to have fair and equitable value in the things that we take pride in. So thank you so much. Um, we proudly live in Prince George's County, Maryland. It's a DC suburb. And we, um, my husband and I married in 2010, and um, our family grew quickly thereafter. We have three little boys. Um, I'm from Central Virginia, so mom is up a lot, as is my stepdad. And we were quickly outgrowing the house we lived in. And so we decided we needed more space. And we you know, recognized that we had to put our kids in school. Does that mean public school or you know, private? You know, there were so many factors. The house is supposed to be your most expensive investment, and it's supposed to provide a return. And we drove to neighboring Montgomery County and Anne Arundel County and Great Falls, Virginia, you know, Fairfax County area, um, so on and so forth, and nothing felt right. It felt like our, our church family is here in Prince George's County. Um, the kids that our children have known since they were born, a lot of our friends are there. This is what community is. And we couldn't whitewash our home because it's widely known that Prince George's County, Maryland is predominantly African American. And so if we had put a picture of a white family up, it really would not have meant much to an appraiser because they would have known that the house, um, to arguably to the, our left and our right, are owned by people of color. So we, we said, you know what? We are going to build our dream home in the county that we love, and we know that we're going to do it and probably um, come in under value somewhat. But what caught us off guard was the amount. And so, in short, our house was appraised originally, and our build cost was almost $1.7 million for our home. This air, greater Washington area is expensive, much like you know, the San Francisco area. And with that reality, um, we had to figure out going in, OK, we're going we're gonna to double down on the county, and we're going to probably have to come to the table with some money. But what caught us by surprise was the amount. Um, we initially got an appraisal of one, it came back at $1.2 million for a $1.7 million home construction. And my husband, under, being a banker, understands the process. And so we had an advocate in our home, and he challenged the appraisal, uh, uh, appraisal and said, well, before you come, actually, before you do this appraisal, full disclosure, I want to be um, an, my own advocate, and I'll be involved in the process. And the bank called us back and goes, this has never happened before, but our appraiser asked to be removed from your appraisal. And so we had a second appraiser assigned, and that appraisal came back for 100000 more, but still $400,000 short of our actual build cost. And the issue we really had with that is because the day we came home with our youngest son from Sibley Hospital, we decided to drive by a spec home that our builder had listed recently. And that home sold for $2.4 million. And that home is a, the best comp for ours because it's the same builder using the same products, the same square footage. We arguably have a few amenities that they don't have. We have an extra garage. We had you know, two offices. And um, that home sold for a million dollars more than what our home could even appraise for. And so um, 
the reality of that is that you know we had to come out of pocket in addition to having a down payment to have a house. Now we have to make a decision, and our decision was we'll cover the difference um, because this is our forever home. Um, but the hard part, I think, for us was recognizing that we are blessed and fortunate and able to, to do that, and it was worth it to stay where we were to do that. But what happens when you're the first time home buyer, you're 20 something years old, and even a $5,000 difference could prevent you from moving forward or force you to pay more for your home? And so, you know, thank you again for shedding light on this because it impacts people of color from all, you know, standpoints of life. Um, and I really have to salute my husband for understanding the process and you know getting us the um, a better appraisal, but really helping to help me understand how flawed the appraisal system is. Thank you so much. That's just infuriating. And as a banker, have you seen this in in other contexts besides your own personal experience? And what have you learned from that? And how did it equip you to challenge what was happening? Yeah, one of the things going in, uh, you know, I have seen it in the past. Uh, one of the things going in I knew was that I needed to ensure that I had comps. So I went out and did research, connected with the realtor to ensure that I had comparables in the marketplace. What was interesting, though, you know, one of the things obviously appraisals use is within a certain mile radius. The challenge with that is you're in an entire area that's undervalued. You know, your comps are going to be undervalued. So it was incumbent upon me then to go outside of that immediate area and go to another market, a neighboring county, and was then able to pull comps that I then provided to the appraiser. Even with that, though, that was a challenge. Even with the additional comps, the value did not come in where I anticipated it should have come in or near our cost. So the challenge comes in, you have to make a decision. You know, what may not be a good economic decision, a financial decision, uh, you're, you're making but it's a good community decision. It's a good decision for your family. It's a good decision for my kids to grow up with people that look like them, that they can relate to. So you have to make that trade-off, and you really shouldn't have to make that trade-off. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, Secretary Fudge, was that I think about the house my father uh, bought. He owned it for 40, 45 years. And the value of that house, and it was a predominantly black community, it did not increase at the rate of inflation. So he lost, he lost money on that house. But it meant so much to us from how we grew up, having a, a, a family home that we kind of still go back to and visit. But you shouldn't have to make that trade off. You really should. Right. Well, just, just, just know this, that it really is my great privilege to work for a president and vice president who will not tolerate injustice. Not only will they not tolerate it, they won't ignore it. And it's been ignored for far, far too long. I mean, I think it's, it's important that we understand that this is systemic within our society, but this administration has decided that they are going to take on this challenge, and it is a big one. We know that racism permeates what we do every day, and I know that it's hard. I know that it's difficult, but we are ready to take on the battle. And so I just want to thank you all for sharing with us, because people don't often realize until they hear stories like yours how significant this is. And so thank you for sharing it. I mean, I just can't imagine, you know, I, I, I am a somewhat quick-tempered person. <laughs> and so um, I don't know what I would have done. But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you have handled it so well that we can't thank you enough. I mean, you all are great Americans, and I'm just happy to know you. I thank you so much. Thank you. Well, look, this is a start, we hope, of a greater understanding of how real this problem is, how consequential it is for each of you as individuals, but for your children, for your ability uh, to build and to transfer generational wealth uh, for our communities. When you think of you know, Prince George's County as a... Uh, venerable, long-standing African-American community, professional community, um, where people have moved up. And for that to be so uh, disparately treated um, relative to neighboring Montgomery County is just, it's not right. Uh, and so what we are trying to do through the work of the PAVE Task Force is one, to call attention to this, and two, to put in place meaningful uh, changes 
that will, you know, diversify the industry, uh, hold, uh, you know, this kind of behavior accountable, uh, and give us and give you all, more importantly, the, the public, the tools to challenge these things and to say enough. So what you are doing by educating others and, and being informed yourselves uh, and uh, speaking up is hugely important. So we're deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you.